Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Huntsville, Alabama for the Association of the United States Army's annual Global Force Symposium, the number one winter meeting of U.S. Army leaders from around the world as well as industry thought leaders uh, and media. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS, and we're here on the BAE System Stand to talk to retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel Mark Signorelli, uh, who is the Vice President for Business Development and Strategy uh, for the platform side of BAE uh, Systems' business. Mark, it's not AUSA unless unless you have a chance to talk. So thanks very much for making time for us. It's great to see you again and uh, back here on the same floor that we uh, we meet on every year. Um, yeah, exactly. It's it's uh, they they all do blur together uh, after after a while. But uh, but each show has its uh, distinct take. Uh, you know, um, obviously, uh, futures multi domain operation is is a very, very big focus. The Army is looking to reset and looking and making that transition to great power competition. We've had so many great com uh, conversations here from the ground combat vehicle side, whether it's General Cummings uh, and General Kaufman, uh, listening to the messages from General Perna, ta listening to General Wesley, uh, General Murray. I mean, it's really been a fantastic. Uh, and General Brown, of course, from the from the Pacific as well. Uh, this vehicle behind you, uh, the XM8, was always one of my favorite vehicles. Uh, sadly, it never reached uh, fruition. This bears, uh, Mark, a startling resemblance to the XM, uh, XM8, but it's not. So talk to us a little bit about what you're trying to achieve uh, with uh, the, the vehicle, given that there's still a requirement for mobile firepower out there, uh, particularly as the Army looks to get more expeditionary, lighter, get out there, but really carry that firepower with them they need. So the real message behind this vehicle is that it's a technology demonstrator. Uh, it does incorporate some uh, components from our mobile protected firepower offering. Uh, this is the chassis that we delivered as part of our bid sample. Uh, and there's a lot of confusion about it's an M8, it's an AGS, and it really isn't. This is a new from the ground up chassis. The only thing we really kept was the footprint. So the vehicle still is the correct width, weight, height, to fit in a C-130, its original design parameter, uh, but it's got upgraded underbelly protection, ballistic armor, uh, new power pack, uh, new transmission, uh, electronics, band composite rubber track uh, for improved mobility. Uh, and then onto the turret, we've integrated a number of new technologies as well. Uh, new fire control system, uh, new sights, uh, and for the demonstration here, we've added 360 degree situational awareness uh, using our electronic systems, high definition uh, 3D cameras. Uh, it gives us a, a unique capability to passive cue both the gunner uh, and commander on the vehicle, as well as an active protection system, which we have integrated on here, the uh, Elbit Systems Iron Fist, uh, and electronic systems Raven soft kill system. I think a lot of people are familiar with Iron Fist from all of the press it's gotten. Raven was recently selected by the U.S. Army uh, to demonstrate uh, soft kill capabilities. Uh, and what we've done essentially is modify some of our uh, aircraft protection systems to operate in a ground environment. So uh, it's another exciting addition to the survivability suite for this vehicle and for other vehicles in the future uh, that make it capable of operating in a broader range of environments. So, uh, you know, walk us through, you know, and, and um, you know, just wanted to add that you have the 105, which uses the stand standard ammunition, so no additional type classification required for that. You have the MTU engine, which gives you more power than the Bradley power pack that was uh, in the earlier iteration of the, of the vehicle. Talk to us about the program. You guys were down selected uh, last year. So walk us through what we're going to be seeing uh, over the next year as the Army works toward its down select decision, and then what the schedule would be if you guys are fortunate enough uh, to win. So we... Uh... We're, look, we're in the process of beginning the build for 12 prototypes. Uh, both companies will deliver 12 prototypes to the Army for testing. It's about a year-long test program, uh, and then a down select to go into low-rate initial production. Uh, right now, that's a, that's a small number of vehicles. I think the Army is looking at, uh, you know, where are they going to employ these vehicles? How broadly will they be integrated into the force? Uh, but. This is a program built around acceleration, capabilities that exist today. Uh, but clearly, what we're trying to show the Army uh, here is that there are uh, iter iterative upgrades that can be applied to increase the, uh, the capability of the system. And uh, when, uh, and, and IOC, what would the target IOC date be? Target IOC is 2023, I believe. 
and and I'll have to check that. All right. Uh, so. But but it's a pretty aggressive schedule. It is to very try aggressive. To. It's very aggressive, intentionally so. Uh, and the Army built the requirements around uh, an aggressive schedule, and they've also been willing to accept some risk uh, in doing that. So it's a little bit of a different perspective, very much in line with the what we've heard from Under Secretary McCarthy, General Murray, uh, the entire Army leadership team that. It's a new era of platform development uh, and fielding for the Army. And uh, I, I have to ask you about the uh, M551 Sheridan. You were a, a Sheridan uh, crewman uh, with the 152 uh, shillelagh on it, but I'm going to save that for the end. But that also was a rapid requirement that got fielded very quickly at the time uh, to give that mobile firepower. Uh, let me ask you a question about um, weight, uh, because you guys have uh, one weight, obviously, to get you to be C-130, I mean, b barely, right? I mean, it's at the shorter end of the C-130 range, but you can still move it by air. Talk to us where you are on the light side, where you are on the heavy side, because you have a very, very modular, uh, non-reactive armor that you can put on the vehicle in order to give it that protection, but also that air mobility. So uh, at the very low end, we can reduce the weight of this vehicle for air transport to just under 19 tons. So you're right, it's at the high end of C-130 mobility, but we have retained the footprint so it can fit in that airframe. Uh, on the heavy end, we're just over 26 tons, uh, full combat weight, uh, and that includes uh, uh, ballistic protection equivalent to a Bradley 360 uh, and AMP V underbelly protection. So, so we've been able to take advantage of some technology upgrades to retain the footprint but make it a more capable vehicle. And also talk to us uh, about uh, the archer vehicle you have, because the Army's really uh, attracted to the idea of wheeled uh, artillery uh, to give it that uh, mobility. Talk to us a little bit about archer. Yeah, so we've seen uh, an interest from the Army in a, uh, in a wheeled uh, mobile howitzer uh, to complement the uh, ultra lightweight M777. Uh, and there is an operational needs statement out there. And so we've had a number of conversations with the Army about the capabilities our Archer systems brings. Uh, 52 caliber length gun tube, fully automated system, multiple rounds simultaneous impact capable, uh, three man crew in an armored protected cab. Uh, today on a Volvo chassis, but that chassis could be changed to a man chassis. Uh, or I, we're also potentially talking to Oshkosh about the ability to do that. So it would really be responsive to an emerging Army requirement with an existing system proven in service with the Swedish artillery uh, uh, that would bring a completely new capability to the light or medium weight forces. And uh, roughly what sort of weight are we talking about? So in its current configuration, it's about 80,000 pounds. So it's a big vehicle meant to be heavily protected and armored. Uh, that's certainly adjustable depending on what are the requirements. Um, I want to go to some of the new stuff that you guys have on the stand, but give us a quick MV, uh, you know, where you guys are on the program, uh, because it has been a couple of months. We spoke in October about it, but to give us, give, give our audience just a little bit of an update where you are on AMP-V. So AMP-V, the first hull, uh, is in, has entered weld, uh, and will deliver that first vehicle in May of 2020 uh, to the Army. So uh, on a relatively aggressive timeline to transition from test, EMD and test, uh, into production. Uh, and we're under contract for the first two uh, years of LRIP. So uh, that program is off and running. And uh, I know there's been some press about some potential reductions in quantities. Uh, what we've been assured by the Army is that the total buy remains the same. They may just slow down uh, the rate at which they buy them a little bit, at least in the, in the near term. Uh, so uh, talk to us about the rockets in a box that's on the ground, uh, as well as the, the new ammunition, which is very common to what you have on the naval side of the portfolio. Yeah, so, uh, so we have here the uh, APKWS in a ground launch configuration. Uh, that, that system could be applied to practically any turret, uh, uh, much like the tow launcher is on the side of a Bradley. So a little bit of a different ground launch capability, a different use for the very popular APKWS weapon. Uh, we also have the hypervelocity projectile uh, under development uh, primarily as a U.S. Navy uh, program, but we show it here configured in three different uh, for three different environments. One is to be fired from a Navy five-inch gun, one from an Army 155 millimeter cannon tube, uh, and also from the electromagnetic railgun. So, uh, so the idea there is that you can take this single 
high velocity, very agile projectile uh, and use it across a spectrum of launch platforms against a wide range of targets. And uh, uh, looking at everything from ground targets, air targets, uh, counter missile, counter UAV, uh, a lot of different uh, missions for a single uh, flexible uh, projectile. Um, and uh, talk to us a little bit. I mean, we heard uh, from the Undersecretary and also General Murray, uh, but also uh, Generals Cummings and uh, and Coffin about sort of future vehicle requirements uh, and what the future force needs to be. There's uh, steady work on a new tank uh, that's going on. Uh, you know, obviously you guys are also the artillery, uh, uh, the tubed artillery uh, company. Uh, you know, re remanufacturing and putting the M109 now on a uh, on a on a Bradley chassis. Uh, but then there's even talk there of figuring out how to extend ranges. Uh, talk to us about how you. You guys are looking at the strategic portfolio going forward as the Army looks to make, the, you know, go through the Bradley replacement process and go through the tank replacement process. So, um, in the world of artillery, closest uh, and most dear to my hearts, uh, right, uh, we are working with the Army on the extended uh, range cannon artillery program. Uh, conceptually, it would use an M109A7 Paladin PIM chassis, uh, upgrade the cannon and gun mount, uh, and with the potential to achieve ranges out to about 70 kilometers with what you would call relatively standard munitions. Uh, so we're working with them, auto loader, semi-auto loader, reduced crew configuration, uh, a lot of opportunity based on the upgrades to that base platform that the Army's already made uh, to enhance it with new capabilities in the future. Uh, for infantry fighting vehicles, obviously, we, uh, we might be a little bit interested in the uh, optionally manned fighting vehicle program, but also the larger NGCV portfolio. We talked about AMP-V and MPF being part of General Kaufman's portfolio, uh, OMFV, but also the robotic combat vehicles. And, uh, and that what I consider to be a true revolutionary capability to integrate into that armored brigade combat team both with the RCV medium weight and RCV heavy. We might have even had thoughts that a platform, something like this, uh, might be a good platform for a RCV heavy. Uh, in terms of future tank, uh, I think some of the interesting conversations today are around, uh, is it an unmanned gun platform or is it a new tank? And uh, I think that's gonna be an interesting dialogue with Army, industry, and certainly the doctrine and tactics folks about how do you integrate either a new tank or a new unmanned platform into a formation uh, as a very heavy gun uh, wingman, I guess you'd call it. And uh, speaking about heavy guns uh, or heavy caseless round firing, I'm sorry, any historic quirky vehicle uh, I love, and you and you just couldn't help but love uh, an M551 with a 152 millimeter uh, shillelagh. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what it was like to be a crewman on, on one of those, uh, because you have literally been scarred by one mark. <laughs> so so actually this was back in ROTC summer camp, okay, okay. and we were firing uh, firing uh, the Sheridans, and uh, my, uh, my lip might have met the front edge of a uh, of a crewman's hatch uh, when we fired, and uh, there's still a scar back there that I enjoy. <laughs> and and that was because the uh, 152 Shillelagh round was, shall we say, energetic for the chassis. Is that a way of putting it? Well, when you have a projectile that's designed for a 65-ton vehicle and you put it on a 20-ton vehicle, uh, there tends to be a little bit of reaction. <laughs> I know, every time you see them fire, I mean, what was it, the first two road wheels? The first two road wheels came off the ground. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. very, very, very sporty. But it was a, a quick uh, vehicle. It was. It was, uh, it was uh, I think it was a good uh, lead-in for a concept like mobile protected fire. I think it did prove that light forces need that kind of mobile support. Um, the Sheridan probably was a platform of its time, which was a long time ago. Uh, and I think we're very excited to see the Army looking at uh, bringing that capability back to the light forces uh, with a fully modernized platform. Mark Signorelli, always a pleasure, sir. Uh, thanks very much. Best of luck and look forward to talking to you again well before AUSA. But if not between now and AUSA, I'll talk to you in October. Something tells me in October we're going to be having this conversation again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, Mark. Thanks very much. Thanks and I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, you were a 109 guy, and I don't know what I was thinking uh, <laughs> about, about that. But uh, thanks very much for your patience. Great. Glad to, Vago. Thanks.